want to begin by thanking the Center for South Asia for organizing this, and especially Sanchita and Punita for so patiently making sure that we all got here. Um, we have been talking about archiving, but I'm going to move you um, to thinking about display and collection of contemporary art. Um, on February 25, 2012, far from the institutional ambits of the contemporary art world, an extraordinary art installation opened in a hall in the Sri Ganesh Vidya Mandir High School in Harabi, a slum in Mumbai that is now home to more than a million people but an area which nevertheless remains at the margins of public civic services. Organized by Sneha, a Mumbai-based non-profit focusing on women's health and sponsored by the Wellcome Trust, a London-based institution for research in public health. The Kari Kari at Home installation marked the culmination of a year-long dialogue, year-long dialogue on art and health, involving 19 participants from low-income communities of Dharavi and Santa Cruz, Mumbai, and three international artists. Certainly, with the unprecedented proliferation of new museums, an escalating market driven by art fairs and international patronage, the institution of global biennials and exhibitions, contemporary Indian art has now gained a new visibility and a place in the global art map. I, however, invoke Kirby to foreground the recent emergence of a dissonant cartography. My paper seeks to demonstrate how the involvement of non-profit organizations are generating parallel and often competing exhibitionary networks that definitely appropriate the language of the globalized art world, but for completely different ends. At the first glance, however, Gharpe appears to fit well within the paradigms of community-based art practices that have now emerged globally. Like most community art projects, the aesthetics and politics of Karpe too was molded by the desires, aspirations of the three primary groups involved in the project. The non-profit, under whose aegis the project was organized, the artists, and the participants from Dharavi and Santa Cruz. If the artists Nandita Kumar, Susie Vickery, and Sudhara Kolme perceived their involvement in Karpe as a principled extension of prior transnational collaborations, and a concomitant investment in community-based art, the non-profit hoped to use the project to archive existing non-formal networks of health practices in the city. The third group, the participating women from the Harvey and Santa Cruz, certainly brought a nuanced perspective to questions of urban health, but their interests finally coalesced around the forms of domestic labor through which their socio-cultural identities are constructed. These concerns informed the works that the women produced in collaboration with the participating artists. Objects displayed in the installation thus invoked the domestic and deliberately explicit terms. This resonated well with the installation's title, Gari Kharbe at Home. Equally significantly, the involvement of international artists and deterritorialized funding networks brought into sharp focus irrevocable and allegedly post-national entanglements between local and global conversations on collaborative art and sustainable development discourses. Indeed, increasing numbers of artists have now turned towards transnational collaborative community-based art in the recent past. Broadly, the aim of many of these projects has been to identify specific social issues within a particular community and work towards affective change in the shape of sustainable development. Needless to say, the collaborative nature of such projects has also necessitated a rethinking of both the figure called the artist and the work that this figure performs. Think, for instance, of the New York, Berlin, and Chiang Mai-based artist, Rikrit Tiravanija's Chiang Mai Communal Rice Farm which is an experiment in sustainable ecology as an art practice, but a project that also finds a parallel life in the art gallery through the medium of photography and film. In turn, 
the autonomy of the artist and the ontological status of contemporary art have emerged as a renewed focus of critical inquiry. Think, for instance, of Claire Bishop, who positions participatory art as premised on invoking a relational antagonism between the artist and art's constituencies. Grant Kester's understanding of the immateriality of dialogue as the primary locus of art production in community-based projects. Or even Mivan Kwon's critical examination of the reconfigured relationship between site, community, and art practice. However, even as Bishop, Kester, and Kwon re-engage earlier Western modernist alignments of the artist authorial agency and arts audience to foreground the changing nature of artistic labor and autonomy, the history of modernism in most locations beyond Europe and North America does not elicit artistic autonomy as either a privileged or a discursive site of practice. Can our conceptual lexicon for collaborative art then transcend the finitude of its intellectual home? Or do places leave their imprint on purportedly universal concepts in a way that calls into question purely abstract categories? What kind of traction, for instance, does the act of collaboration hold in Dharavi a sprawling slum in the heart of India's cosmopolitan financial capital? Garpe unfolded at a time when the local participants' rights to habitation had been brought into sharp question through a series of evictions and dubious promises of resettlement by the government as part of the Dharavi redevelopment project. Ever since 2004, multinational corporations, state agencies, and civil society groups have been engaged in a struggle for bottom-up inclusive development processes in Dharavi. For Dharavi's inhabitants, then, the right to collaborate, and as an extension, the right to be at home, or gharpe in Dharavi, had thus emerged as the locus of struggle. Against this backdrop, Gharpe's organizers abandoned prevailing strategies of public art that posits the figure of the artist as the interlocutor between disenfranchised subjects and the urban art sphere. Instead, the participants from Dharavi cast themselves as the primary authors of the installation, engaging their audience in dialogue to negotiate a consensus for change in Dharavi. Each work displayed in the exhibition thus foregrounded complex intersectionalities of social and aesthetic arrangements. Take, for instance, Santa Cruz resident participant Sunita D'Souza's ensemble, consisting of two steel vessels placed on a gas stove. The work drew on D'Souza's experience as a 25-year-old mother of two, whose life is lived out through a cycle of repetitive motions associated with cooking and cleaning, cooking and cleaning again. This rhythm is interrupted by spurs of domestic violence, which she and her husband, she and the daughters, routinely face. On the days her husband abuses her physically, D'Souza does not cook or clean. Even as a refusal to perform her domestic duties does not dislodge the hierarchy that structures her home, she nevertheless disrupts it by withholding her own labor. This disruption becomes a mark of her resistance. Covered with patterns made of black bindi and thread, one side of the kitchen stove registers her defiance. Placed on top of the gas burner, the unadorned aluminium vessel is filled with burnt photographs of spoiled food. The other side of the stove, one that is layered with brightly colored bindis and thread, represents days of marital calm, a cord. On these days, D'Souza makes sumptuous meals for her family, photographs of which can be seen. D'Souza's work not only bears testimony to the processual nature of pedagogy, pedagogy and collaboration spread over the 12 months leading up to her pain, but also makes obvious crisscross trajectories of local and global conversations that shaped the project. Her association with the project, for instance, began with a photography workshop led by the Mumbai-based documentary photographer Sudhara Kolbe. In certain ways, Olbe's own involvement in the Dharavi project was a logical expansion of his earlier work with marginal urban settlements in Mumbai and his photographic workshops with underprivileged youth in Los Angeles during a residency at the Getty Museum in 2010. Likewise, in Dharavi, 
all the way introduce participants like D'Souza, who had never held a camera, to the techniques of documentary photography. The photographs of, this, of food in D'Souza's installation were thus part of an assignment on food and nutrition. Over subsequent months, the conceptual apparatus that governed D'Souza's ensemble gradually emerged out of loosely structured consciousness-raising sessions facilitated by Nandita Kumar, who lives and works between New Zealand and India, and the British artist Susie Vickery, whose work in textile raises critical questions regarding gender and labor. The adoption of consciousness-raising sessions, a strategy devised during the second wave feminist movement in America, may indeed seem dated. In praxis, however, the act of sharing and analyzing personal narratives realigned the terrains of private experience with the collective and the political in a context where the question of survival often supersedes any explicit articulation of a feminist agenda in the local. A nascent feminist politics was thus articulated and ultimately inflected the works displayed in Karpi. The project, simultaneously intersected with global conversations on art and activism, when the participating artists involved in the project turned to the seminal 1972 feminist installation Woman House, produced and displayed in an abandoned house in Los Angeles by Judy Chicago, Miriam Shapiro, and a group of students of the new feminist art program of the California Institute of the Arts. Certainly the involvement of Kumar, a recent graduate of the Cal Arts, may have been instrumental in this decision. Yet the artists could just as easily turn to more recent projects that have taken the domestic as a discursive side of art making. While third wave feminism does make space for more nuanced interrogations of race, gender, and sexuality, the use of Foreman House as a model recognized that Carpe's participants continue to negotiate essentializing constructions of femininity and domesticity. Gharpe, however, retains certain crucial differences from the woman house. Feminist aesthetics as iterated by the woman house was most emphatically articulated around the female body. This becomes explicit in the nurture and kitchen, where all perceptible surfaces of the kitchen, including the floor, walls, cabinets, and appliances, are covered with pink paint. Pink plastic eggs metamorphose into breasts, cascading down from the ceiling. One does not find such an engagement with the gendered body in Karpe. In D'Souza's gas stove, the physicality of her own body is absent, even as her, expe even as her experience of domestic violence is foregrounded, abstracted as it is from the body on which marital violence is enacted. Bindi's multicolored dots with which women traditionally adorn themselves as markers of marriage embellish the gas stove, referencing D'Souza's body only tangentially. Even in instances when the female body is sighted directly, the body itself is represented through a network of familiar relationships. Take for instance the bed in Karpe, which becomes the canvas upon which the various stages in a woman's life is played out. Conceptualized by Mridula and executed in collaboration with Kumar, the surface of the bed is layered with a collage of photographs each image carefully culled out from Mridula's family photo albums. In a certain way, the collage functions as Mridula's biography, a narrative self-portrait of sorts. In the far left of the collage, we encounter Mridula as a child with her younger male sibling, a photograph that all too quickly morphs into an image of Mridula as a young woman holding in her arms her own infant daughter. In the far right, an unidentifiable skeletal body can be seen lying on a bed, similar to the one that frames the collage. Even as the collage appears to synoptically map out Mridula's life, childhood, childbirth, future death, with extreme economy of imagery, there is still a certain overflow of forms, for the background of the collage is covered with smaller portraits of Mridula's family. Tied in tight clusters, Bulging stuffed fabric dolls pinned onto the surface of the collage completes the mise en scene, the color pink marking out the body of the artist herself. 
The surplus of faces and bodies in Ridula's self-portrait refers us back to the collective process through which the work was conceived. The work was conceptualized during a consciousness-raising session that explored the women's relationship with domestic artifacts. When asked what the bed represents, 16-year-old participant Afreen had reportedly observed, a bed is an object upon which one sleeps with many. In childhood, the bed is shared with siblings and parents. In adulthood, the bed is shared with husband and progeny, occupied solitarily only after the body it has degenerated and death is impending. And it is this idea that gets material form um, in Ridula's work. Thus, even as Garbe resembled the woman house, what transpired, I want to suggest, was a series of subtle displacements that ultimately served to interlink the domestic and the civic through a network of familiar relationships. A picture window made this explicit. In the work, we encountered two distinctive compartments with two sides of the window panes presenting two thematically opposite pictures. One side stands in for the dharami that the participants routinely see as they look out of the kitchen windows. The other side depicts the dharami that they desire to see. On the one side, a tiny window carved into turquoise green walls opens onto a desolate landscape starved of greenery where beer bottles seem to rain from the sky. On the other side, a large window opens onto a courtyard with a park and a well, an oblique reference to the water scarcity that is a part of Tharavi's everyday reality. Paved roads and covered sewer systems are carefully marked out. Yet another reference to Tharavi's numerous unpaved roads and open sewers, which offer mosquitoes with an ideal breeding ground. During the exhibition, as the participants from Dharavi introduced their works, they also engaged the audience in dialogue. By this act, they attempted to non-coercively rearrange desires through a negotiation of consensus for change in the local. Standing within the space of Dharavi, their address would have been immediate and sensory. Transforming the home, the curb, into a site for public civic intervention. In a sense, what was collaboratively presented in Karpe was a certain vision for redevelopment, an image of a new Dharavi, consonant with the desires, aspirations, and needs of its residents. Reintroducing the politics of place, such projects then demand that we reconnect practice to place, not to recover an imagined rootedness, but to think of a new ethics for our practices that are emerging through the politics of locality. It is this that gives Karpi a different texture, I want to suggest. For having situated collaboration as the core component, Karpi does not fully belong to any one of the three groups who participated in the project and cannot therefore be collected or displayed as dismembered objects dissonant from place. While the material objects that constitute the installation are now stored in the offices of the non-profit, the authorship of the object lies in part with the groups of women from Dharavi and Santa Cruz, without whose presence the installation cannot function. The participating artists, on the other hand, occupy a far more ambivalent position, given that unlike most collaborative art ventures, Kirby constitu constitutively evacuates the privileged position held by artists as interlocutors between disenfranchised communities and the urban art sphere. For us then, Garbe offers a peculiar insight on practices of collecting and displaying contemporary art. It suggests that when certain kinds of knowledge about contemporary art seep into contexts marginal to its normative exhibitionary and cultural ambits, they are in turn elaborated through subtle displacements that ultimately complicate deterritorialized systems of exhibiting and collecting. Not all contemporary art, Gerber indicates, can be collected readily. Thank you.